In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Holy Father God, thank you, Rabbi, so much for the immense love and kindness and charity in this uh, book of the Bible. Um, to give us a taste of how lovely life would be if we live like these people. In spite of the hardships, it never endures. Be with us, O Lord. Talk to us. Touch our hearts, O Lord. Change our hearts. Help us to uh, live this way, like these people. We ask you to please hear us through the intercessions of Mary and our saints and martyrs. So please, you from the beginning, Mary, powerfully love giving cross. Please, the Lord, make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our trespasses, we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us on into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thou is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Open that. All righty. Um... Uh, as usual, I'm going to just go over a quick like a summary of the stuff we uh, um, covered last week. And I want to invite everybody, if they have anything to add or ask or whatever. Um, we saw at first, the uh, we were in, in chapter 1 from verse 15 to 22 to the end. And we saw the, the we talked about the progression of commitment. There are those who bail on you right away, those who... Um, maybe offer, but then they don't follow through, even though they sincerely offer. And there are those who may go where you go, but then when things get tough, they say, see ya. But then they go where you go, have your people as their people, have their God as your God, etc. Um, it's a progression of like seven steps, actually. Um, and then we talked about um, the commandment of love. Uh, this is my commandment that you love one another. And by this, we know love because he said he laid down his life for us, etc. Um, and we said that the commitment that Ruth had for Naomi is not just the commitment of one person to another, but it's the commitment of one who is leaving her people and her land and her gods, small g gods, and her whole life behind to live with a true believer, and to worship the one true God of this believer with this believer. Um, choosing that, that life, that identity. And then we said that Ruth had the same faith as Abraham, and it's fit to be called a daughter of Abraham because she did like him. And her love had three uh, characteristics. It was a, a proactive love, an active love, a sacrificial love, and a love without guarantees, an unconditional love. And um, then we said that the greeting that Naomi received after so many years when she went back to Bethlehem is actually a, a good testament to her, is that Naomi was very well loved wherever she was, and she left a very strong impression where she went on whomever she dealt with. And why is that? Because she lived out her faith daily. She dealt with everyone as the Lord would have wanted her to. Um, she did that back home with her people. And she did that with her daughters-in-law, uh, even though they're Moabites. Moabites. And Ruth is not the only one with the awesome, Yanni, who's an awesome person in this book. Naomi is too. And we will see more. And then we went to say that it is okay to say, ouch. Remember that? We said it's okay to say, Ash, there is a time to weep, a time to vent. We're not machines. We're not robots. We're not inanimate objects. And we said not always, not even like frequently, but there is a time for it. And it is okay to say, ouch. Does not mean that you are sinning when you say, ouch, <clears throat> when you're hurting. And then we also said that even though at times I may be miserable and I know None of it would have taken place without God's permission. I still know beyond a doubt that God is good. 
And whenever I speak about God, I speak about him with all love and reverence. We saw how she was, Naomi was, was talking about God, um, you know, saying I went full and came back empty, etc. But she calls him the Lord and she calls him the Almighty. Her reverence and respect for God is, is not dependent on how good or bad things are. <clears throat> And then we said that sometimes a person may feel like they're empty or worthless or miserable or a huge failure or devoid of anything good, while the truth is that their life is full and is packed and full of success. Um, they're just not really aware of it. When this happens to us and we begin to feel this way, it is sufficient for us to remember that we have that same good God who is always good. Can't tell you how many times I've been talking with people and they have this um, evaluation of the life that it's, it's so bad, it's so horrible, it's so negative, it's such a failure, it's so miserable. And then as as we talk and and, um, yeah, and I show them how like it's, it's the perspective is not really correct, it just changes um, everything. <clears throat> And then remember, we talked about the Passover and the first fruits. And we talked about how the Passover is the symbol of the uh, uh, crucifixion, and the first fruit is the symbol of the, is the res resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we saw how barley is a symbol of life. That's how they made bread. And we saw how with the, the feast of the first fruits, where the high priest would take the first bundle, the first uh, sheave of barley, and um, wave it in front of the altar, in front of where God is. And then, only then, people could partake of the other new, the rest of the harvest, the new, the, the rest of the new barley. And uh, our Lord Jesus Christ is the high priest himself. And he himself is also the first fruit, the grain of wheat that died, so that it can bear much fruit. And he was lifted up on the cross and he was offered before God and ascended to God the Father. And only then, could we use our new barley? Only then could we live our new life. <clears throat> and that's why I remember when uh, St. Mary Magdalene uh, clung to him, he told her, do not cling to me. Don't hinder me. I'm about to go to my father and your father. And my God and your God, don't hold me back. Don't delay me. I still need to ascend before God the Father as the first fruit so that Y'all and everyone can be able to live that new life, that new barley. And then we talked a little bit about going to church to take versus to give. We said, when you go to church, do you look only for what the church will give you, whether it be uh, benefits or networking or fun or to find a spouse or festivities and merriment or with fun friends or pleasant preaching or stuff like that that tickles your ears or do you go to church looking to give her to labor and to toil to satiate her and to make her a place of joy Naomi pursued and stuck with, I'm sorry Ruth pursued and stuck with Naomi like knowing she wasn't gonna get anything from her really she went she did all this to to basically to care for Naomi because she loved her so much and she loved her God so much and she didn't want to let that go our Coptic Orthodox Church is very rich but do you only go to take from her or do you also go to give her to fill her never fails y'all whenever I see anybody who goes to church as a spectator there's always issues like uh, the the, uh, the 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 disruptions uh, distract me. The I don't like the tones. I don't like the language. I want this language or that language. Um, I don't like uh, this style of sermons. I don't like whatever. It's like hey, how you into like you're going to Disney World for rides? Yeah, any, uh, I'm going to offer. We go to church to offer to give to commune. And by the way, I'm not only talking about the place of worship when I say church. Uh, when I say, do you go to church to, to take from her or to give her? But I'm also talking about the people in the church. 
your brethren. Do you tend to find yourself more attracted to hover or to cling to those who are full only? Those who are fun, those who are smiling and laughing, those who are wealthy, those who uh, are healthy, those who are, you know, have everything go great. Or do you insist, not accept, but do you insist on clinging on also to the ones who are um, empty or bitter so that you may fill them, so that you may help assist them, so that you can care for them? It's a question for each one of us to answer for ourselves. Uh, anyway, that's what we covered, um, the main points of what we covered um, last week from the second half of Ruth 1. Before we stop chapter 2, does anybody have any questions or comments or anything? Okay. <clears throat> um, let's read... Um, From verse 1 through 14. Verse 1 through 14. What do we have? Hmm. Who's going to read for us? I will. Uh, okay, thank you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God to me. Except I don't see it. Oh, okay. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. So Ruth the Moabites, the Moabites, said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him, in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. Then she said, and went and gleaned, then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was the family of Elimelech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she, and she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning till now, though she rested a little in the house. Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field nor go from here, but stay close by, my young woman. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I find, found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done in, for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and how you have left your father and your mother in the land of your birth, and have come to the people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, Come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed parched grain to her and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. Glory be to the Holy Trinity, our God, forever. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> So much. Um, so much awesomeness. Okay. So it starts with saying Naomi had a relative who was very noble, very well respected man, and he was also very wealthy. This is verse one. It says there was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, 
of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. I never knew this. Do, do you know what Boaz means? Might be more obvious in Arabic. Boaz. Means Abu Laiz. <laughs> Um, father of glory, father of uh, glamour, um, Laiz. Um, or if you know somebody named Aizat, it's like the same the same thing. He's not just Taiz, he's Abu Laiz. Um, so verse two. <clears throat> so they're just so far nothing happened. We don't. There's no interactions or anything, but they were just telling us that there is this awesome relative, and his name is Boaz. Like so, just as an introduction thing. To, so with that, when we when we meet Boaz, we know who he is. Verse two. So Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, "Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him, in whose sight I may find favor." And she said to her, "Go, my daughter." There are at least three lessons, three nights lessons in this verse. Can you guess any of them? She asked permission from... Uh, Very from good. Home. Even though she was about to do something good, you know, that was, you know, to feed Naomi and herself, she still shared what she was about to do with Naomi as her mother. You know, as a form of like submission, respect, etc. What and else? She wants to be a, an active. She wants to be an active, not lazy. Very good. Woman. Ruth was a, a very proactive person. She she was a hard worker, uh, as we will read in a little bit. Uh, as we say in Texas, a getter doner. Like she she took initiative. Okay. Awesome. Two for two. What's the third one? The third one's kind of tough, but I believe. Go, my daughter. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, no, from what Ruth did. She's hum she's humble, like to collect this kind of job to do. She accepts to do that. Hey. Okay. I mean, that's true. Um, she, she realized that it is God who gives favor in the sight of people. So she, she, she believed that God will give her favor in sight of someone. That's awesome. That's another one, too, that I didn't even think of. Like, in whose sight I may find favor. Like, even though the gleaning thing was was a law, it was an order by God, and people could just go do it, and nobody would should ask them any questions. But she still knows that I'm not entitled to this. I'll see if I find favor in, in somebody's eyes, and they would allow me to do this. She's very modest. Okay, very humble, very modest, very, humble. very meek. But so I'll I'll tell you this. It's it's in the form of what she said to Naomi. She, she did asked not for permission. I'm sorry. Go ahead. She asked for permission. You're getting very close. She asked for permission to do something that she already was about to do. You know what I'm saying? Like she did not ask Naomi, "Hey, do you need me to do anything?" Uh, or or what can I do to help? You know what I'm saying? Like, this is something I've noticed in me uh, personally, and I, and I and I have a very very close friend of mine from another city who does the total opposite. You know, Yani, I I only stop at, hey, do you need anything, or can I do anything for you, or uh, stuff like that. And the answer is typically like, no, no, thank you. Like people don't. Usually, they don't like volunteer the stuff, but sometimes when we see a need and we ask the other person those yes or no questions, you know, like, do you need anything? Would you like me to do this or that? The answer is like, sometimes I won't say even often, no. And then we move on. But th the lesson is that it is better when you notice a need 
You just do it. And if there is someone with authority that you, um, if there is someone with authority that you check with them first, you know, if it's something that is not like a personal thing to somebody, but to tell them, hey, I'm going to do so and so and so. Please permit me. Please let me do this. You know what I'm saying? Like if, if you see somebody who who seems hungry, don't ask him, would you like something to eat? No, just go get the food and give it to them. If you see oh, somebody... Oh. Yes. Sorry. I, I I agree with what you're saying, but I will share that personally for me, this is a difficult thing. I think because boundaries have been like respecting another person's personhood has been so ingrained in me mm. that I feel like just doing it, you know, and then giving it to them is almost like an imposition. I, I'm not saying that that's right. I'm just saying that that's, I feel it because of like culturally that I would going on. dare wager that it's not because boundaries have been ingrained in you, but it's because you've been in position so much by the culture that you became too sensitive to it. That even when it's something good, sometimes you're not sure. You oh, know, if, maybe. Uh, <laughs> you've been burned uh, one time too many <laughs> by things forced on you so i i think I'm this gonna... is a good point where we're where, you know everything in balance yeah and you don't just shove something down person's throat but just just go ahead and do it here and if they say no thank you khalas, yeah, i'm not hungry if, say you make him a sandwich say no 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 i'm not hungry say okay don't just push and shove and make, force them to eat it yes max I, in, in my side in my opinion i found something here that she is someone she, she is thinking she is thinking positively not negatively like the the employees or or like um someone he's working with someone and and he came to his manager like for example was was a problem or an issue in in a war or a servant came to abuna was 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 in a problem but he provides a solution was him so like was was that problem he suggested something not like putting that oh there is here is the problem here's the issue and yeah he do whatever you want or you what what you can do I yeah. yeah she, she didn't <laughs> she didn't sit there with Naomi and go oh what are we doing here oh how are we gonna live oh we're we gonna go hungry oh we have nobody it's like she just okay what can I do oh yeah clean okay I'm gonna go do that and that showed us, like we saw in the last chapter, that that Naomi's been teaching her. She knows the 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 law of Moses. She knows the the rules of the land. <clears throat> but yes, um, being positive, and you'll always notice this. By the way, proactive people are typically very positive people, and I would dare say that passive people tend to also be very negative people. <laughs> Am I making this up? I think so. I think uh, I think so. All right, verse three. She said, "Go, my daughter." So, halal, she has the blessing. No, so, verse three. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, that guy that was mentioned in verse one, who was of the family of Elimelech. That phrase, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, it's not very well, it's not very well explained or translated. It's not the best or clearest translation in, in English here. The more appropriate translation is this. Her fate was to embark on a part of the field belonging to Boaz. It's a bit more obvious in, in Arabic, I think. Um, Her fate was to embark on a part of the field belonging to Boaz. There are no coincidences in the life of a true Christian. You can say... Uh, if a believer lives within the boundaries of the will of God, they will find that there are a lot of really nice, quote-unquote, coincidences in their life. 
and and we will see a lot more of that. Yeah, Buna, I'm sorry, I didn't understand this very well. It's, did she mean to go to a field for Boaz? Or no, she she didn't even know love. who Boaz was. It's okay. just that saying as she was going through the fields to glean, it happened. Yani besotfa or yani by luck. But yeah, but in Arabic it's clear. It says ittafaq nasibuha. Yani her fate. Yani God set it up to where she would end up oh. walking in a field of Boaz. Okay, I got you. And that's what I'm saying. When somebody like is so loving, so giving, so sacrificial, so proactive, they will, by coincidence, find themselves <clears throat> in awesome places. Something lovely in verse 4. Look at this. Now, behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. And wait a minute. I thought this was in Bethlehem. What's up with that? Bethlehem is a village, but the fields are on the outskirts of the, of the city. Yes. The fields are like uh, out of town or out, out on the outskirts. But that's not the lovely thing that I'm talking about. Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, the Lord bless you. This is a, we talked about this a little bit in the introduction. This is a very lovely example of the art of eloquent speech and mutual love and respect, regardless of rank or socioeconomic status or education or ancestry ancestry or, or whatever. Um. And the axis or the, the center or the pivotal point of this type of eloquent sweet speech is what? Or I should say is who? <laughs> the name of God. The Lord. The Lord. I don't know if you've noticed this, but, you know, with us, yeah, you know, Catholic Orthodox people, a lot of time as we speak, we say, God willing, thank God, or, you know, stuff like that. Sometimes when I'm talking to people, yani, out in the store or on the phone or whatever, not non cops, yani, when I say those things, so I, I'm saying without even thinking. And they're like, I see, they're like, oh, yeah, like, or, or they smile or they're, they're like, it's almost like they forgot, oh, yeah. Um, the name of the Lord. Have you ever seen an owner or an employer or even a foreman? Speak this way with his laborers. The Lord uh, be with you. The Lord bless you. As you know, we've been dealing with construction for like a year and a half now. And I promise you, <laughs> the answer is no. It's it's the total opposite, actually. Um, we, we somehow believe the lie that you got to talk with people harshly. You got to talk forcefully. You gotta put people down if you wanna, I don't know, keep yourself up or you gotta get things done or whatever. Um, and then you see the result of Boaz doing this consistently, day in and day out. It is not just a one time thing. Or the effect of him doing this consistently is what? That the reapers, they're not like surprised, they're not confused that. They themselves start to speak like he speaks. They themselves now starting to follow suit. So this is a, a, a double-edged sword. Like if you're around people who like curse a lot, even though they don't mean to insult each other, you'll find yourself that there are some bad words slipping out. And if somebody who usually curses a lot finds themselves around people who don't, they will little by little be kind of embarrassed to speak that way and they will like change the way they speak uh yes Moody. yeah Buna, i have a big question here it's always facing me why like i i always not meaning to say god willing um i'm saying it like uh it's it's normal was me to say it but sometimes I'm stopping myself to say it 
was the people out of, outside of the church because I'm not scaring to say it, but because I'm I'm not sure that they're gonna to accept that or not. Like I'm not I'm I'm feeling that I'm forcing them themselves about something, or like I'm sharing something they're not believe believe in it and they will not love it. You know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So and I uh, something related to the culture or something like that. I I, I appreciate. Sorry, I, go ahead. I, I want to understand it. I appreciate sure, your I'm honesty good. and your courage um, to ask this question. And what you're asking is what a lot of people are experiencing. And my my adamant, very strong, very resolute answer is no. Keep saying it. Keep saying it. Yeah. We as Christians. I've said this many times before that that evil is spreading at a rate faster than it could have been simply because we as Christians are too quiet. We are afraid we will offend. We are afraid we will somebody won't like it. Okay, so what? And really like 99.99% even if this person is an atheist, even if this if this person is whatever, they they won't really get offended. Think about you talking with somebody who is of yeah, and he lives life in a completely foreign, different way that you would never even think to live that way. And then they speak about themselves or about their lifestyle that way. You're not going to say, "Hey, don't speak like that," even if you don't like what they say. Um, I want to share something here. I just remembered that, uh, like a situation happened with me in in my work before, and normally I said, "Thank God." And then find my my friend. She's she was she said, "Why are you thanking God?" So I, I, I chugged. What? <laughs> how is it, how how you are thinking about this, Yanni? How you are asking this question, Aslan, to me mm. about it? But if if we get if we go deep in that also, like. I know that we can say that, like, in text messages with my coworkers or something like that. Mm -hmm. But how about, like, if, if I'm sending email <laughs> professionally? Can I say that? Go for it. Please do it. In any setting. And even if somebody doesn't like it or something um, undesirable results from it, God will reward you a hundredfold. Did, so what did why did this lady say why did you say thank God or why are you thanking God? Was she like an atheist and she didn't like it or she was inquisitive no, she, like she was like she why was did Christian. you say that? No, she was Christian and that's that's what, what yeah that's what my, made me <laughs> charm like. Well, you bring up a good what? point in no in no yani actually using this kind of stuff you know, God willing, thank God etc. It it opens the door for discussions it open it's a lesson it's uh now okay <laughs> i'm sorry i'm sorry I can't... to take it long about I... this but no 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 this is great i was gonna say that i can't live like a selfish jerk and then use the words god willing and thank god actually if i live this way it's better that i don't say god willing and thank god and yeah, i have said this before yanni if if i'm not gonna live like a christian please don't tell people you're a christian um, because then they see um, maybe you behaving selfishly or or inconsiderately or whatever, and then they go, oh, see, this is what Christians are. But if we behave like a Christian should, then please, please, whenever you find any opportunities, say God willing, say thank God, say thank you, Jesus, thank you, Lord, or say I was at church yesterday, like all these things. We're going to do the service at church. Go for it. Actually, the majority of people are searching for this. It's just now everybody's been so bullied into just keeping quiet. And I've told people this, that if you're afraid to say such things or to just be like outwardly a Christian like that, lest you be canceled, then guess what? You've already been canceled, right? So, I gave them Orban today in the office. There you go. Yeah. 
And we have a we have a church member who who never found out anybody at at uh, at at her work, you know, who maybe had sick, was sick, or had a problem, or whatever. She would get them holy water. She would get them uh, oil. Uh, obviously, not endil oil, but like the simple oil. And uh, so what is this? She said, "Oh, this is so powerful. This is this. Let me tell you." And people <laughs> love it. And 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 many people would mm -hmm. ask her because she keep coming to me. I need more holy water. I need more. I'm like, what do you bathe in this stuff? And she said, people at work are asking me for it because they saw what happens. But all all this stuff is because they see how she lives her life, how how diligent a person works, how honest they are, how if they mess up, they say, my bad, I'm sorry, that's on me, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, so we stopped at saying that like how, because Boaz does this consistently, now his reapers, the laborers, the people around him, they also start speaking like he speaks. And you can sense a lot of love. By the way, the book of Ruth is full of love, different kinds of love at different levels. And if it, I didn't notice this until I, I discovered it when I was preparing for tonight. If, if you pay close attention, this book is possibly the only book in the Bible that does not mention any kind of sin. Check it out. Um, Verse 5, then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? <clears throat> now, there could be many reasons Boaz noticed Ruth. Can you think of any? What's your question again? Why do you think Boaz noticed her? I mean, he's, he's a wealthy man. These are huge fields. There's lots of people gleaning. There's lots of women gleaning. Why did he notice this one? I just heard somebody say because she was beautiful. I don't know. Is she, was she? I, I don't know if the Bible said that she was uh, like physically beautiful. Because she she was, she's a beautiful person, of course, but uh, what, Rafat? Because she was working hard. Maybe. Okay. Maybe she was working hard. Like there you go. Person. That's that's one of the reasons I was thinking of that. Like, perhaps because she was working so diligently. Uh, Mama, what did you say? Because she's not Jewish. <laughs> Very good. Because possibly she was dressed differently from the typical Israelite woman. Like she looked different. Um, obviously, also, like she's she's not one of the workers. She's not one of the people he typically sees. You know, as we said, Boaz is a symbol of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he's the good shepherd who knows his sheep and he knows people, etc. etc. He might have a good memory. <laughs> he might what? Had a good memory. He might have had a good memory. <laughs> um okay, but there's something very interesting about what Boaz asked and how he asked. Can you tell what it is? Who's the young woman? Oh, that's the question he asked. But what is interesting about it? Is he respecting her? No. I mean, yes, but... He's wondering who gets to be around her? Uh, Closer. No. Rafat? Uh, he asked... He didn't ask who is this girl. He said, to whom is this girl? Yes. Like, belongs to whom? A very question. Whenever you see somebody you don't know, you say, "Who is this person?" You mm -hmm. never say, "Whose is this person?" Mm -hmm. Like, to whom does this young woman belong to? <clears throat> the The interesting thing is that when you walk with God and you work in His field of harvest, you don't end up with a relative, but you end up with a bridegroom. And none of this is coincidence. God often, it's interesting because, right, like, well, I don't want to burn it. I'm sure you guys know already. But God often asks us who are working in his field of harvest already. Yani, don't, don't just 
assume that you are his because you're in his field gleaning and benefiting. He often asks us who are in his field, whose are you? And he wants us to ask this question to ourselves, to whom do I belong? Why am I living the way that I'm living? What are my intentions of what I'm doing? Who owns me? Who owns me? Whose am I? Hopefully, we will always be able to answer a confident, I am yours, Lord. I belong to you. You own me. I am my beloved's and he is mine. Is there any in the Song of Songs how at first she says, my beloved is mine and I am his? But then later on, as she matures, she says, I am my beloved's and he's mine. Uh, verse 6 and 7, we'll read them together. It says, so the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, it is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, please, <coughs> please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and she has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Once again, we see the hard work of Ruth. That she's been at it all day. And once again, like her proactive, etc. Once again, we see that lovely eloquence of speech and love and respect. How? From this verse. Where, where do we see lovely eloquence of speech and courtesy and respect? When she said, please, let me glean and gather after the reapers. So, Yanni, yeah, for saying please. And her modesty, Abuna. Sorry, requesting. what else? Which verse? I don't see the verse. Here. Seven. Oh, sorry, Akhtit. Yeah. I read six and seven, but I forgot to, to advance the, the screen. She said, okay, so it's in verse seven. Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. <clears throat> what, what about this that shows the, 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 the art, like the eloquence of courteous speech? I think it's the same. She still asked, like asking for permission for what she was supposed to do Aywa. and listen it was a known thing that when the reapers are at it during the harvest season anybody can come by and glean and pick after them and nobody could like ask them or tell them hey what are you doing or, or anything like that and that was an order from God this was a common known thing they were actually ordered to Leave the corners, and if they drop something, leave it. And don't embarrass the person. So Ruth could have said, hey, it's my right to glean <laughs> out of my way. No, she wouldn't say out of my way. But like, she, wasn't she, she could have just, she could have just um, walked in behind them and started gleaning without saying a word. But regardless of what is her right or not her right, she still does the loving respectful, courteous thing. Please, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. What, Missy? I said she didn't feel entitled. Yes. Which exactly. is what you said. Exactly. Somehow, at one point in time, we went to it's my right from even though it is my right. It would be great if we go back to, even though it is my right, then dot, dot, dot. You know what I'm trying to say? At one point we went to, it's my right, so blah, blah, blah. Or it used to be, even though it's my right, this is the right way, I would say. This is how it should be, even though it's my right. Please. I think the trick there, though, Abuna, is um, is not in eloquent speech. 
but in actually the attitude of the heart. That's what that I meant. If, if the answer is no, <laughs> to not like lose it. Yeah. And, and had they told her no, she would have said, okay, thank you. And she would have walked by and went somewhere else. But yeah, I'm sorry. I Just to be clear, when I said the eloquence and loveliness of speech, I meant that is stemming from a sincere heart. That 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 uh, is. Thank you for bringing that up because there can be sweet speech that is not reflective of what's really going on in my heart. We don't want that one, because man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Abuna, also, uh -huh. I think it reflects that she, I don't know the right word for this, but I think like she's has a like she's recognizing and respects the other people like um, opinion or like the other people decisions or whatever, you know, Space. even though yeah. she has the right to do whatever, but she's aware of like, there is like human out there, you know? Yes. And it's, and, and in a way it takes us back to whatever, like you were saying earlier, it's like how you can help to be thoughtful about like helping people. Um. Oh, you didn't say thoughtful. It's my it's my word actually because it's what I was thinking. But it's like how like when you think people like they Perfect. need help or whatever, mm -hmm. yeah, you go do it. And I think for me, I, because I I kept thinking about it because I was thinking the same way as Missy's. Like, what is the boundary? Because sometimes like, are you be like becoming intrusive? And no, uh, what is the word? In intrusive. Yes, intrusive. Intrusive. Thank you. Or are you just like very thought thoughtful? And I think the the key here. It's like when it's really coming from your heart and recognizing people and their needs independently from your vested interests in helping, you know? Hmm. So that's you, it. You remind, as you were speaking, you remind me of something that was like uh, that, that uh, one of my best friends that I'm telling you about. This was, gosh, maybe between 15 and 20 years ago, like before I was a priest. Um, there was a, a a priest who came from Houston uh, to College Station to pray the uh, uh, andil for the families in College Station, which is the unction of the sick prayer, which is like a, about an hour and a half. It's like a seven prayers. It's a it's a relatively long prayer. So, um, and and came early morning and and uh, prayed the prayers, and um, the plan was that this priest was going to stay like all day and then we were all going to eat together. But it was during the great fast and so we we're not going to eat until like maybe four or something. And so the priest is sitting there, you know, uh, in the corner, like answering phone calls and texts and stuff like that. And and then uh, my friend um, asked, as the priest, he said, Abuna, can you like come? I wanted to ask you something, and, you know. And, and he took him to like one of the bedrooms and then when they went to the bedroom, he said, uh, like, here's like, take a nap. And then he closed the road, the door and walked out of the room. And the priest was was very appreciative because like he wasn't going to ask the people, hey, can I take a nap in your house? But he was obviously exhausted. And um, and if he said, no, no, thank you, he would have walked out halas, and sat in the living room with everybody else. But that's what we're talking about. Don't be push. Don't shove it down people's throats. But... Uh, just do it. You know what I mean. Um, okay. And now, I think that, I'm sorry, Buna. Can yeah, I go ahead? Something? I'm sorry for saying that, but sometimes we're thinking a lot more than to to do out of love. Hmm. I always said this that if if you think long enough, you'll end up not doing anything. <laughs> um. So, and really, you know, when when your heart is in the right place and you are doing good for the sake of doing good, even when you mess up, y'all, it will still be appreciated. It will, especially if you don't push, it will still be appreciated and, and it will still be, you know, fine. Um, especially if that person like needed it because you notice this person needs this. I'm not talking about um, hospitality. No, I'm talking about when you notice a need, my friend like saw that priest was like so tired and 
has to wait, you know, until eating time came. And, um. Anyway, okay. And so, now, yes. <laughs> sorry to go no, no, to no, go back to the to go back to the Bible study. Like the thing that Boaz did, which is the thing that we need to do, is to actually be able to see the other person. Like, mm. you know. I know that for me, that's that sometimes is difficult because I'm in my head about all the things that I got to do mm. that I miss a person. But he, like, even though he was in charge and everything, he was there to see. You know, I was thinking about earlier today about like how, you know, everything God commands us is really for whose best? For our best. So when, when God tells me to love neighbor it's for my best and if if we oh my gosh if we all did this as one body whoo um to notice the other person it makes life so so rich so nice anyone else okay and now <laughs> We go to the very first interaction between Boaz and Ruth. And notice that it was Boaz who approached Ruth. Verse 8 says, Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter. Will, we, will you not? He's not being like a forceful bully or whatever, but what he's saying is, Please listen to what I'm about to tell you. And once again, we notice that lovely kindness, gentleness, I'm not going to call it eloquence or speech, uh, the courtesy, um, seeing the other person. He Now he knows she's a Moabite woman. He knows she's a foreigner in a completely foreign land among foreign people in like in a very strange atmosphere, very strange culture, like everything. But then he, he does what? He calls her what? My daughter. It's Wow. And what does Boaz tell Ruth? He says, do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. How lovely. Now, <laughs> if this were today, what do you expect the owner of the field would say when he sees a strong, energetic Hard-working woman working hard non-stop in gleaning from his field. Tell like, uh, hey, <laughs> aren't you getting tired? You know, uh, yeah, enough. Right? Why, why don't you go check some of the other fields? There's plenty out those, you know, of those out there. But no. Not Boaz, not Boaz, who is the symbol of our Lord Jesus Christ. He wants you to keep at it. He wants you to keep taking your fill from his field. And not only that, can you imagine the harassment a young woman would have received from those reapers while she's trying to glean, especially if she's a foreigner who has no family to protect her? Yeah, ladies, put yourself in that situation, in that position. That would be terrible. No, he tells her, stay close to the other young women, meaning to the other souls who are already here in my field. Again, we're, 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 look, as we're reading, we're mindful of the allegory between uh, Ruth being the church of the Gentiles and, and Boaz being our Lord Jesus Christ. So he tells her, uh, stay here among the other souls that are already working in my field. They will keep you good company and protection. Not just no harassment, also protection. <clears throat> you now belong. You now have people. You're not a foreigner anymore. It's just Amazing. This was not just a generous offer for her to have enough grain to eat. This was an offer 
uh, to her an offer of belonging, an offer of protection, an offer of reassurance, an offer of peace. Can you imagine somebody who goes to a new country, knows nothing and knows anybody, does, doesn't like, is just that that anxious feeling of, of being alone and, and somebody like really comforts them like this. What an honor for this foreign pauper or beggar, I mean the human soul, to have such a noble and rich and glorious and glamorous man like Boaz, and I mean our Lord Jesus Christ, to approach her and to talk to her and to invite her and to reassure her and to offer her fulfillment and protection. Do you feel this way in your everyday life? Do you feel like you are entitled to nothing? Do you feel so generously bestowed upon? How wonderful it would be if one actually has this mindset daily. Who am I that you even notice me? Like the psalm says, who am I that you're, who's man that you're mindful of? Now, our Lord Jesus Christ said in John 4.38, he said, I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. Ruth here is a symbol of God inviting the, 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 the beggared and lowly and destitute church of the Gentiles to his field, to reap her fill from what she did not plant. And he tells her, do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here. This is not just generosity now. This is um, an exhortation. This is uh, like a and a commandment, like an advice. Okay. And this is exactly what, what our Lord Jesus Christ said in Luke 9, 62. He said, no one having put his hand on the plow looking and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Halas, now that you are in my field, now that you are among the other souls that are mine, don't look back. Don't get out. Don't leave. For whatever reason, please don't leave. Now that you have found your way to my field where my bread is, please. Do not depart. Do not go to the field of someone else. Don't do that to yourself. Okay, verse 9. <clears throat> it says, Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? He's saying, Stay in my field. He's further reassuring her. Stay in my field. And don't worry. I have command. Apparently, this is a common thing. You know, it's like insult to injury. A person is like so poor and has nothing and has to go glean. And then she has like the reapers bother her or harass her or whatever. So he's, he's telling her, stay in my field. I have commanded that no one bother you. And she can tell that when he commands, everybody follows. But actually protect you. And it gets even better. Look at this. And when you are thirsty, mm -mm -mm. and when you are thirsty, he, he does abundantly above and beyond what we ask or understand, as we read in the Bible. He knows it's hot. He knows she's working hard. He knows that the well is far. It's by the city. And it's a hassle. Should have to leave the field, walk all the way over there, draw water. It's like more work. And then walk back if she has the energy to, to glean some more. It's like, no, actually, like back then it was like such a hectic job. Like back then they would have somebody like a water boy, okay, who would go back and forth and draw water and bring it back, draw water and bring it back so that they wouldn't interrupt the reapers from reaping, so that they would harvest as much as possible, as quickly as possible, and put it in the, in the 
silos or whatever, like the, the stores. He's telling her, basically, consider yourself mine now. Not a beggar, not a pauper, but you will be one of his. <clears throat> and when you are thirsty, <clears throat> excuse me, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. You may reap what you have not planted and you may drink from what you have not drawn. Just come and stay in my field and you get protection, coverage and nourishment and, and quenching and and belonging. Um, I hope verse 10 is a prayer that each one of us says to God or at least thinks it to God um, like as often as possible in our life. Verse 10. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground and said to him, why? Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? Remember what Jews looked at foreigners at as? Like dogs, like unclean, like disgusting, like can't even be around them. Have you, have you prayed this prayer or at least sought it? Like, Lord, why have I found favor in your eyes? Why do you treat me with such kindness and grace and mercy and generosity and compassion? I know what I am. I know what I deserve. And I know what I don't deserve. Your love, O oh Lord, to me is overwhelming. And it makes no sense to me. I hope this is our truth. That this is this is our state of heart. Why, why, Lord? Why, why have I found favor in your eyes? Like this, this makes no sense to me. Also, I think we said this before. God bestows his mercy and his grace upon us. Not because we are good, but because he is good. He lets his sun shine upon the righteous and the wicked. Don't let that uh, yourself think that because the, the sun shines on you, that it's, oh yeah, it's because I'm righteous. It's because he's righteous. This is the opposite of, of entitlement. I don't know what the what the terminology for it would be. Verse 11. <clears throat> and Boaz answered her and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done. And here we see that there is a connection between favor and grace with charity and good works. Like, remember what I said, if there's going to be one theme that we, we get from the book of Ruth, what it was? You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. If you sow love and mercy and kindness and grace, rest assured, you will certainly reap love, mercy, kindness, and grace. And many times over, you can never outgive God. <clears throat> continue verse 11 it has been fully reported to me all that you have done to your mother-in-law since the death of your husband how you have left your father and your mother and your land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before what's the term for when you put uh, yourself in somebody else's shoes it's empathy how lovely it is when, when a person is empathetic. Is that the right term? Has empathy. Like senses where other people are coming from, especially if the other people are not behaving like they should be. You know, if they're not behaving in a, in a pretty way. 
Matthew 10, 42, it says, and whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water, only a cup of cold water, in the name of a disciple, assuredly, I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. You, O Ruth, have loved your mother-in-law, Naomi, with proactive love, sacrificial love, and love without guarantees, unconditional love. So likewise, you too will also receive Proactive love, sacrificial love, love without guarantees. Not that you're owed it, not that you're entitled, but there's definitely a correlation between favor and grace and between um, charity and kindness. <clears throat> Verse 12 says what? The Lord repay your work. And a full reward will be given to you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Remember when we talked about how the, the pivotal point, the center of the speech is God's name? Look at this. The Lord, repay your work. A full reward will be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings, under the Lord's wings, you have come for refuge. Who else was told... Uh, a similar phrase about being rewarded with a full reward. That one's tough. Sorry. Um, eh, anybody? Any guesses? It's our father Abraham. It's in Genesis 17. After uh, the offering. Uh, the Lord told him, like, you be believed as he said, I will I will multiply you exceedingly. I will give you a full reward. Ruth had the same faith of Abraham, and thus she was rewarded with the same reward of Abraham. Abraham became the father of many, and Ruth became the mother of many. Because as we will see later on, our Lord Jesus Christ came from her lineage. And I love this. The Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Those who go under God's wings for refuge will never be confounded. And I love even how Boaz, he, he, he's like the Lord is the one. You came under his refuge and the Lord will take care of you. This is not me, Boaz. Giving the credit to God. Verse 13. <clears throat> then she said, Let me find favor in your sight, my lord. Allah? What what do you what do you mean? She just asked, said, like, why do I have this favor? Right? You already found favor in his eyes, Ruth. Like, what's up? It's like, no, I want to remain in this favor. I want to stay in this favor. So let me find favor uh, in your sight, my lord. For you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Go back to the Bible and see how many verses you can find that talk about how the Lord is my refuge. The Lord is my fortress. The Lord is, is my comfort. The Lord is my joy. All these things that we try to seek out there from the world or from other people or even from spouses or children or or money, or whatever, it's it's only in him. She says, I am your maidservant, kind of like what St. Mary said. And then she goes, though I am not worthy even to be called one of your maidservants. True humility and meekness. And and and, and we know she's very sincere. And even more eloquence of speech indicating that's coming from a sincere heart. Verse 14. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, come here and eat. Not only when you get thirsty, so not only leave her alone and let her clean, not only, hey, don't go to another field, keep gleaning here. They won't harm you, they won't harass you, I commanded them and they will protect you. And not only uh, when you are thirsty, come drink from the water that you have not drawn. But at mealtime, hey, come here and eat. 
um, though it is not your right to approach and eat, come here and eat. Now, Boaz said to her at mealtime, come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. What's up with this vinegar? It's kind of like um, salad dressing. dressing, if you will. Huh? Dressing. Dressing. Yes. Um, back then, they would mix a little bit of vinegar with wine. Uh, I think we have a dressing. It's called wine and vinegar, right? Or something like that. Oil and vinegar. Oil and vinegar. Um, so they would mix a little bit of vinegar with wine uh, as something that kind of like refreshes you, wakes you up, and like it acts as a, a bit of a, an analgesic, like to help with the, the the muscle soreness of the labors. It was kind of like today's Gatorade, <laughs> if you will. Um, Nam, somebody said something. Mama was there. Uh, yeah, does it remind us when they offered the vinegar was nerd to Jesus? Yeah, it's the same. It's the same um, uh, idea. Yes, the same the same chemicals, if you will. Mm -hmm. Only with only with that one is it was way more sour. Um, yeah. it was very very like strong because this is somebody who's in excruciating pain and dying. It was like an act of mercy, actually, even though it's bitter. To to help yeah. this person kind of like numb a, a little bit. Um. So look at this, y'all. So she sat beside the reapers, even though she's a, a gleaner, right? A one who's glean and a foreigner. And uh, indeed, Naomi's people became her people. <laughs> and indeed, Naomi's God became her God. She sat beside the reapers, and he, Boaz, passed parched grain to her and she ate and was satisfied she was full and she kept back some she had leftovers did you notice that who does this he hand fed her he he gave it to her to eat again a symbol of our lord jesus christ and communion and the church of the gentiles and and not only that was she as filled? No, but there was leftovers, just like the miracle of feeding the multitudes. Leftovers, more than what you want, more than you could ask for. Um, we have more to say about verse 14, but I'm going to stop here. I think that's that's good for tonight. Um, comments, questions, concerns, compliments, anything? She is humble and grateful. Mm. And the Lord look after these people. Amen. Yani, it's it's a person a person who is humble and grateful and graceful and kind and giving and sacrificing and loving in their speech and in their actions are this is all stemming because they are all that stuff in their heart. And their thoughts. It's, it's a relation between the master and the servant, which is really astonishing. Yeah, I can't. It exactly reminds me with Jesus Christ and us. Yeah, and and the the really like, and I, I, I encourage you, but don't do it just as a homework thing but like think about it until you get to that state lord why have i found favor in your eyes why do you treat me like with such kindness why why do you treat me like your child like your son i know what i am i know what i deserve um abuna mm -hmm. how because i i do have this thought a lot but how can we? Because, and but I also think that it's important to 
accept Jesus love to us. Oh, with pride, you know, it, but like, so yeah, because it's a very thin line between, uh, like why well, you're doing this to me, I don't deserve this, you know, and like self pity and like being humble about knowing that God is way more generous and his love is way more bigger. And he's doing this because it's his nature. Mm. You know what I mean? Yes. So, yeah, it's like, so how you don't fail, no, fail, no, how you don't fall in the, in this trap. Like, yeah, it's like neither pride, neither self pity, you know? As you were speaking, first of all, thank you for bringing this up because sometimes people um, go go to the other extreme, which is which is really not what God wants or likes at all. Yes. As you were speaking, the thought that came to mind is that who am I focused on, me or God? Mm. Because I say, oh, I am nothing. Who am I to deserve your favor? I am this. I am that. I'm nothing but this. Like it's all about me. It's the focus is me. And and but the other one is like, who am I to have found favor in your eyes? Like, you, you get what I'm saying? Like, yes. when yes, one I'm focused on how sense. bad I am, or how worthless I am, or how unworthy I am, and in the other one, I'm thinking about how awesome God is, and how kind He is, and how generous He is. Yeah, and actually, the second the second one, it has more humility and joy to it, mm -hmm. like gratefulness. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I need. Um, yes, Rafa, go ahead. Uh, uh, the, the first when he told her, I will, it was reported to me what you have done mm. uh, for your uh, mother in law. Uh, again, th this may be another analogy of the importance of works uh, in addition to the grace. So mm. even though he was graceful to her, it was completely a grace from God who commanded this uh, this, this reading thing and grace from Boaz, but also because of her her, her acts did count. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's crazy because like like as like the Bible says, if we have fulfilled everything and did everything, we are but unprofitable servants. Yes. But then the Lord, even though we are unprofitable servants, if we even reach that level. He goes, I want to reward you. Come enter into the kingdom prepared for you because you have done this and this and this and this and this. Um, and also, also when he asked her to stick close to the reapers and follow them, this reminds me of similar verse in the Song of Songs. Mm -hmm. uh, follow in the footsteps. When God uh, talking to the bride of, of, of the song saying, uh, follow the footsteps of, of, of the flock and feed your uh, goats uh, yes. by the fins of the shepherds, something. Yeah, exactly. if you pay attention to it, like the the, the, like the allegory and the analogies are like, even the words are, are uncanny. Like when he says it has been reported to me, like that that reminded me of, of when the Lord that was saying that like the angels report to him um, what we do or what is done to us and what is done to the little children. He said their angels report to me. All right. Um, we'll stop here, God willing, and uh, next week we'll we'll resume with verse fourteen onward. Um, let's pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Lord, who are we to be even uh, permitted to be in your presence and to address you? It's overwhelming um, and very comforting. We're very grateful to have such a gracious, loving, uh, forgiving God who sees us as his children, who loves to go out there in the streets and get the uh, naked, filthy orphan babies and to make them his children and to... Uh, feed them and bathe them and wash them and dress them and clothe them and, and make them his own. Help us, Lord, to never leave your field. Help us to never seek to glean anywhere else. 
and to keep our eyes on you and to rest knowing that you have your eyes on us. We ask that please hear us through the intercession of me and all you see some matters so please if from the beginning and the mighty power of your love and cross. Please, O oh Lord, make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us as they are daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now the love of God, the Father, grace is only begotten. Son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, the communion, the gift of the Holy Spirit, be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. I have it. Remember, we have Kiah praises this Saturday. Yes. Vespers at six instead of seven. Kulisan to Taibi. Thank you. Thank you.